Sometimes on Time Team, we find the biggest mysteries in the most surprising places, and they don't come much bigger or more surprising than this. Because this is Tregreig Castle in South Wales, one of the largest medieval castles in the British Isles. And when you get inside, even in this spooky mist, you can see it's absolutely vast and completely empty. Nobody knows how many buildings were in here, what they were, or why it's so big. But all that's about to change. We've got a unique opportunity to launch a full-scale attack and paint in this vast blank canvas. Today, the ruins of Tregreig Castle overlook the tranquil valleys of South Wales. But 700 years ago, this area was one of the most turbulent places in Britain, the Welsh Marches. This was a militarised zone, ruled over by the Marcher Lords, powerful English barons who built a network of impregnable castles to keep the Welsh natives in check. But not enough to keep an invading army of archaeologists at bay. And anyway, we've been given a warm, if slightly misty, welcome here by the castle's current owner, David Williams. How long has this place been in your family? Since 1554, there was a gentleman called Roger Williams acquired the estate, the lands and the castle. But it hasn't always looked like this, has it? I can see a lot of these stumps are really quite fresh. It was a complete keep full of trees of Norway spruce here until about two years ago, and they were cut down and the whole nature, the atmosphere of the place changed in the inner keep here overnight. Did you learn much once you'd cleared away all the uh, forestry? I've always grown up with the feeling and knowledge that you wouldn't touch anything here. Yeah. It's a scheduled monument. As far as I'm concerned, nothing has ever been disturbed, so this is a very exciting time. What would you like us to uncover for you during the three days we're here? Any old relics would be uh, most interesting. What was really going on here through our sort of ancestry Which side of things. Well, if it's old relics he wants, David's picked the right team. We've got them in spade loads. This really is an extraordinary place, isn't it? Absolutely. I've seen some castles in my time, but this one presents a, a real mystery. If you look at the plan here, you've got all the things you find in a standard castle. You've got a gatehouse, you've got a tower, you've got a really long curtain wall all the way around the side, but you've got this big blank space in the middle. It's in the same sort of ballpark as Windsor Castle. It's a huge site. <laughs> Mick, what do you think was going on inside this middle bit? Well, there's lots of stuff we don't have. We'd expect to have a big hall, probably other halls, kitchens. We'd expect to have private accommodation, bakehouses, breweries, stables. We don't know anything about that at all. Huge empty space, three days, what do we do? Well, we'll, we'll ge do some geophysics, but we have a real problem with that, with the tree roots and all the wood lying about. It's not going to be very easy for John and his team to work in it. We can't sit around for three days waiting for geophys to finish, can we? No, no, but we have other targets as well. And the first one is actually down here in the entrance gateway to the castle. This is where people are coming in to get into that central area. So we'd expect to find the portcullis, the drawbridge pit, perhaps where the gates were, possibly porters, lodges, that sort of thing. Fines? Yeah, because people would have dropped things as they come through, either, you know, personal items or bits off the horses or whatever. This is a good place to look. So we're going to start by stripping this area here. So we're opening two trenches in the gateway to establish the layout of the entrance and hopefully discover personal finds and dating evidence to build up a picture of who was living here and when. We've got a matter. And as the diggers launch a full frontal attack, John and his geophys cohorts are beginning to tackle the vast interior to see what was going on inside. The tree stumps are going to be more than a bit of an issue. But yeah, if we could have a baseline along the north wall. Can the GPS see through low cloud? Of course it can, John. But I have to agree, those tree stumps might pose a problem for you. But however mystified the archaeologists are at the moment, I'm sure of one thing. If Tregreig Castle's seen a lot of action in its past, it's going to see a whole lot more over the next three days. What's an oyster shell doing up here? Or somebody's living in some degree of style. No, 
that this isn't a World War I battlefield. Hidden away among all this mist is the largest interior of a castle I've ever seen in my life. We've already put the first trench in, only another 2,000, and we'll have covered the whole area. Because getting to grips with Tregreed Castle is a huge challenge, a whopping 13,000 square metre challenge, to be precise. So far, we've begun to tackle the entrance through the gateway, hoping to discover more about the castle layout and any finds which tell us when it was occupied. And having only just launched our attack, Phil's already scratched the surface. Wow, well, it is like a roadway. Very, very hard. The question is, how old is it? Exactly. And it's the same at Matt's end of the gateway. I mean, there's, there's road stuff. You know, roads, stones, and stuff right below the soil. So it might be worth me having a bit of a scratch around first, I think. Things are really hotting up as far as our archaeologists are concerned. We've got a trench in at either end of the gatehouse, but about 100 metres away, two of our archaeologists have sloped off into this rather bizarre little cave. Yeah, but it's not a little cave, Tony. It's much more interesting than that. You look above us, look. Oh, is it, um, what do you call it, a garderobe? A, a toilet. It's a, a medieval toilet. toilet. Yeah, no, it's a cracking example, isn't it? How does it work? Well, presumably over the four holes you can see up there, there would have been the wooden seats and the contents would have accumulated in the pit that we're standing in. <laughs> if we're in the pit, where does all the stuff go? Well, presumably it gathers in the pit and it's either goes out through an arch over there, or people come in here and clear it out from time to time. Oliver, are you as obsessed by this little room as Mick obviously is? But of course I am, it's a posh one. And look here, you've got really fine quality masonry. Some of the best stonework in the whole castle. You've got arches above us. I, I've mm. learned from you that over the centuries, people drop things down the Absolutely. toilet. Absolutely, and they don't retrieve them. It's not just you and me. No, no, they don't retrieve them. So you want to dig it? Yeah. It's nice to see a man who's so excited by his work. <laughs> Mind you, he's not the one who's going to have to shift through centuries of human waste. But if Mick's right, we might get valuable dating evidence to tell us when the castle was occupied. Which will help Helen uncover the secret of Tregreeg's history. Ray, what was this area like when the castle was built? Perhaps the best description would be a potential powder keg in some respects. We're in the Welsh marches. And I think that's really an important concept to get our heads around. In fact, the, the word march is Old English for boundary, isn't it? Indeed. You can almost think of perhaps your marcher lords as frontier barons. So would one of these marcher lords have built the castle? I think almost certainly, for a considerable period of time, this territory was in the hands of the de Clare family. Now, I know that Clare is in Suffolk. What was the Suffolk family doing holding lands in Wales? Well, you're quite right. They had substantial land holdings in England but they also had substantial land holdings in Ireland. And bang in the middle, they were lords of Glamorgan. As martial lords, they enjoy certain rights and privileges. Maintaining armies was quite useful, founding towns. So in a sense, the king is allowing them this extra measure of independence, all these unusual powers. And in return, he's getting them to keep this area peaceful, to keep the, the, the Welsh down, essentially. That's the idea, that's the way it's supposed to work. But they were often following their own agenda. You'll even find instances of the Welsh doing a deal with the marchers against the interest of the king. It wasn't a recipe for peace and tranquillity. Maybe it wasn't in the medieval period, but back in the gateway trench, the mists cleared, the sun's out, and Phil certainly seems at peace with the world. Oh joy, the gods have smiled. Look what I've got, a piece of clay pipe stem. Excuse the pleasure, me. the actual... Yeah, Phil, I told you it was a lousy idea to put our first trench in right by our entrance. I'm a happy archaeologist. What's that? I have found a piece of clay pipe stem. Dateable evidence. And it also seems like you found the original floor of the gatehouse. It cannot possibly be the original floor, Tony, because this piece of dateable evidence is underneath this floor. And, of course, tobacco didn't come to this country until, what, the 16th century? Absolutely. And that, presumably, is why you're excavating further down in order to get the original floor. Normally, Tony, that is actually true, but in this case, it's the reverse. What do you we mean? think the original entrance is actually 
up there. <laughs> Phil, I thought the whole thing about archaeology was that the earlier things tended to be lower and the later things tended to be higher. How can you have a, an earlier floor level right up there? Let me explain. I think that what we're standing in is a massive hole. We've got one edge of it running along there. You can see where that edge cuts away. And I think the other edge of the hole is this solid wall of the castle here. So it's like a big pit? Absolutely. I think when whatever spanned that, it might have been a drawbridge or a permanent bridge or what have you, I think that when that went out of use, to get inside, <laughs> they've had to knock a hole in the wall so that it can make a nice gradient into the inside of the castle. But you don't know any of this, do you? It's just theory at the moment. The argument at the moment holds true. Uh, what we've got to do is literally get this later surface planned, then we can take it off, prove that that wall did once join up and that this w there was a complete wall through there, and then we'll throw it home to debate. Well, we're now making good progress on the gateway, so Stuart's ventured outside because the whole castle is surrounded by banks and ditches, which might help us understand what the castle was like, how it was defended, and explain why it's so big. Because Tregreeg's enormous size is one of the main mysteries facing us, since it's completely empty inside. What do you think's in here? Well, we just don't know at the moment. We've got a big open space in front of us. I know, but what do you think? First of all, Looking at our map, we know that this is the Lord's Tower. Yeah. I think this is where the lodgings are, the really, really high status bit of the castle. That's over there, right there in the corner. Oh, yeah, yeah. The other thing that would have to be in that area of the castle would be a hall, a great hall. Maybe something a bit like that, a great hall, which is a, the big focus of the castle where meals and feasts are, are taken. The other thing you'd have to have if you've got a great hall is a kitchen area, a kitchen range. Could be something like that. And if you're looking at the posh part of the castle, the high status end, the other thing you'd really expect to find would be a chapel. Maybe, for argument's sake, put it there. Be a bit smaller, actually. But it still doesn't fill up <laughs> <laughs> much we, of this vast void. Not, a, not at all. We've got, got big open spaces. I mean, those are the posh bits of the castle. You yeah. probably have, at the grubbier other end, you must have stabling for horses. Maybe right there in the north. Oh, yeah. oh I see. Well, Ollie's model would certainly fill in some gaps, but at the moment it's just pure conjecture. And although John's been surveying the interior for nearly a day now, I have to say it looks as if it's been a bit of a struggle. John, they've set you a bit of a task this time, <laughs> haven't they? Well, they've cleared the vegetation, but they left the tree stumps. <laughs> and the, the worst thing are these roots. And you can see they just extend onto the ground and trying to get the probes into that. Yeah. It's like going into a solid wall, and that's the problem. I don't know if I'm going to be able to tell the difference between what is a tree root and what's a wall. Is it too much to expect to have some idea of what was going on in the castle before the end of day one? But at least Stuart's ready to report back on his recce outside the castle. Right, Stuart, I've noticed you're wandering around. Have you sorted it out yet? At first glance, you look at it and think, yeah, castle, ditches, rampart, you know, typical sort of castle-type things. But the more you look at it, the more complicated it, it, it gets. It, it really isn't quite as simple as it seems, I don't think. I have to say that's a usual Stuart appraisal of a site, that it's more complicated than we think. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm actually starting to see, as well as the castle earthworks, are, are earthworks, I think, relate to the Civil War period as if oh. this was defended during the Civil War. So is that is that known in the local history, that the Civil War? It would seem that we have a member of the family, a man called Sir Trevor Williams, who it is believed uh, took a garrison of some 60 men from here to fight against Raglan Castle. Oh. Right, so there could have been some sort of Civil War fort or something like that here then. Indeed. Yeah. So Stuart thinks these earthworks and nothing to do with the original castle but typical of arrow-shaped defences built in the Civil War period. If he's right, how much more of the castle was changed at that time? Phil already thinks that the gateway has been remodelled. Well, these are being covered over, look, you see, they're that much fresher. Look at the crispness of that line there, and they're beautiful. He's now found a wall, and he's trying to find out if it once spanned the whole entranceway to see if his theory's correct. At the other end of the gateway, 
The archaeologists have been investigating beneath the roadway, which has been producing finds that may give some dates for the castle. So what have we got, Steve? Well, an interesting collection. This is a, a ridge tile off the top of the roof. That's fantastic, because we've got accounts of tilers working yes. here in, quite early on in the accounts, um, about 1305-ish. Oh, uh, marvellous. This, this is late 1200s, early 1300s. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um, according to our dating, we've got coin dating for that. Uh... Extraordinary, isn't it, David? <laughs> and what do you think all, about all this? Oh, it puts everything in perspective. It brings it alive, all the accounts that you read over this period of time, and now there's, there's dates, uh, mm -hmm. particularly that Steve is able to put things to. I'm glad that David's easily pleased. Because it's the end of day one, and I'm afraid a single tile won't solve what's going on in that vast interior. But at least we seem to be making progress. And we're finally opening a trench inside it. Make another trench. Yeah, yeah. Based on the geophysics. Well, looking at that geophysics, I can't see that much to put a trench in for. Look, we've put the results on Henry's model, which is absolutely fantastic. And the high resistance there is in red. Now, the problem is, could that be building? Could just be the tree roots, could be the geology. So, in other words, we're really putting this trench in to test the geophysics so we can see whether it would apply elsewhere on this side. That's at least if we have any certainty at all, it must be the perimeter of the castle. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that either. Oh, come on. <laughs> Mainly because I'm not sure that's the main entrance. But it is the main entrance. It's always been the main entrance. No, it's an entrance, probably. But when you look at the course you'd have to get to it, coming around that steep slope, turning in, coming through that very narrow passage to get into this enclosure. I'm not sure that's how they would have brought all the supplies for the castle in. You imagine wagon loads of barrels and wagon loads of sacks. It's a very odd way to come, that is. This is so time, team. This morning when we got here, we'd no idea what was going on in the middle of this castle, but we were pretty confident about the outside. Now we're as unsure about the outside as we are about the middle. And I bet you there'll be even more confusion tomorrow. Welcome back to Tregreeg Castle in South Wales, one of the largest castles in the whole of the British Isles. And that in itself has created quite a puzzle for us because it's not only very, very big, it appears to be very, very empty. Yesterday I was promised buildings here, a chapel maybe, a hall, some kitchens. Well, I'm not a professional archaeologist, but looking down that trench, I can't see any evidence of buildings. Is there anything there? No, there's nothing there, Tom. In fact, if you didn't know, that this was in the middle of a castle, you wouldn't think it was near any archaeological site at all. But there must be some evidence, mustn't there, of buildings around here? Well, from the accounts, we know that there were certainly buildings here, mm. and they're buying amazing quantities of stuff for, for repairing them. One point, there's 3,000 nails, there's 2,000 laths, there's the lime kilns, yeah. there's the masons. And also here, it says new building of various houses in the castle. They're not outside, they're here. Mm. What are we going to do, Mick? Well, we've still got some targets to look at. There could be buildings elsewhere, but... But hold on, we've got a problem, haven't we? This is a scheduled site, Absolutely. so there's a limit to the number of trenches we can there's put in. There's a limit to the trenches. We're going to look across the break of slope down that way. See where the digger is? Yeah. And you remember yesterday we were suggesting about whether there was a bigger gateway down there. And the other thing, of course, is the one thing we do have is a, a socking great building over there and another big building over there. And a lot of this is accommodation, so between the two, in a way, is the most logical place to put the hall and the other buildings. So we've got John and the team starting to do some geophysics between those on the basis the hall might be there. So we're not desperate yet, but we can see desperation in the distance. No, <laughs> we're not desperate yet. Go and have a cup of tea. So hold off the desperation. But this can't bode well. Open a trench in the evening, close it in the morning. However, we are now opening another trench where the ground level changes. Start from here, let's go up over until we get to the top, go over the top of the slope, break of the slope. To see whether that slope is evidence of activity in the interior. It's a bit of pot, and there's another piece here. They're from different parts, but that's more than we had from up there, isn't it? We're on a winner. <laughs> and it's already paying dividends. Yesterday, our trenches were concentrated in the gatehouse where we were beginning to find a road surface. But Phil didn't think it was the original medieval pathway into the castle. And this morning, things seem to have got even more complicated. When I looked at this, I rather suspect you'd think the same as I did. What the hell yeah. is that? And so I 
bring you two esteemed authorities <laughs> and you haven't got the yeah. foggiest idea. Well, it's, it's one of those, isn't it? So, how many PhDs does it take to identify a piece of stone? Obviously more than three. But while they continue their pondering, the rest I mean, of the archaeologists well, I, I are in like full swing. At the garderobe trench, it's taking rather longer than we first thought to clean out the medieval loo. We're still hoping it will eventually produce fines to establish when the castle was occupied. But at the moment, we'll have to rely on scraps from the gateway trenches for evidence. I know we haven't found all that much pottery, but the stuff that we have found is virtually all 14th century. How... why are you pulling a face? How does no, that no, tie no. in with That's what fantastic. we've got? No, I mean, I, I, it, it, I almost felt that you must have made that up to make no. me pleased, because uh, the, the accounts, the detailed accounts, start at, at 1301 and they go on to 1342. What was happening here in the early 14th century? Well, there was a lot of building work going on, and right down to the last well rope, we've got the detail. So who was instructing these people to buy all the well ropes and stuff? Amazingly, they were mostly powerful women. Uh, we start off with Joan of Acre, uh, who's, who's a daughter of Edward I, apparently the most spirited, the most independent of all his daughters. Now, her youngest daughter, Elizabeth, she goes on to inherit to Greek, and she, again, is the most amazing woman. And by the time she's 27, she's had three children by three different husbands. They're all dead, and soon after that, she takes a vow of chastity to ensure that she's not pushed into another marriage. But do you think she would have really been in charge during those years, or do you think there would have been another man in the background? Well, I, th I think that she'd have been calling the shots, because in some of the accounts, um, this, this last one here, um, it says that uh, there's new, new buildings at Tregreeg. It's, it's all done um, according to the lady's wishes, and the lady at that point has got to be Elizabeth. What sort of lifestyle do you think she'd have led, Ray? Well, she certainly knew how to throw a party. Just look at this uh, menu from a, a Christmas Feast 1326. Just look at this. It looks so they're eating half the bird population of South Wales. Look at some of the things. You've got swans, herons, bitterns, egrets, capons, geese, hens, chickens, partridges, something called clells, woodcocks. Yeah, it's a bit of a meat feast, isn't it? So it seems that life inside the castle was quite fun. But that's a little at odds with what I'd first been led to believe. Situated bang in the centre of the marches, Tregreeg was surrounded by hordes of warlike Welsh, who notoriously were the deadliest archers in Britain, as Helen's about to find out. If you hold that there... OK. ..and pull it back as hard as you like... How far are you supposed to be able to pull this back? About that far, about that far. So, if you can imagine, that's coming back to there. You're a little bit taller than me. Yep, so you've got your hand <laughs> right back past your ear. And that's where the power comes from. I, mean, I can't get it anywhere near. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, am I? Go on then, show me how it's done. OK. The muscles in the back of my neck actually are hurting now. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So we just draw it up. God, the force of that is just incredible, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, they, they just disappeared. They came down so far away. We can find out. We can test that. Yeah. yeah. Right, and I've got a bit of a walk now. Right, so <laughs> right. you need the exercise. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's going to take quite a while, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Right, Henry to Helen. I have an answer for you. 223 yards. That's just incredible, isn't it? We could get you no trouble from here. I mean, you're really conspicuous. You've still got arrows up there, haven't you? Can I come back now? <laughs> oh, I suppose so. <laughs> if you can follow those along, Ian, kind of define them a bit. Back in the safety of the castle, Matt's busy working on his trench over the slope. And the change in ground level's now beginning to look as though it's been created on purpose. It looks like it's been kind of stepped up, doesn't it? And Phil's finally made headway in the gateway. Phil, yesterday you had a theory that there was a big pit here and that the entrance to the castle originally would have been up there somewhere. Does that theory still hold? Absolutely, it really holds good. But what we've done is the most important new discovery is this whacking great wall here because this wall helps us to get from inside the castle, way up there, to the outside. This must be some major support for a drawbridge or a bridge that is going to get us from that level out there. Does this archaeology work for you? 
I think Phil's got it right. It's either part of the abutment for a bridge, maybe part of a drawbridge. But geographically, it seems so weird to me. If you look at that level there, imagine something there or higher coming out in this direction. It's, it's more like a diving board than an exit. <laughs> you just plumb it off the edge of the hill. It doesn't make any sense at all. The point of access is right up here above our heads. It goes into nowhere. So I think I kind of get this. The walkway, drawbridge and pit idea seems plausible enough, but something's obviously missing, because the entrance couldn't have led out into thin air. So Stuart's turned to landowner David to see if there's anything in Tregreeg's landscape history which might explain a change in layout. This large house that was here interests me. Is that it there? This is the old mansion house that was probably built in the late 1400s and the first person to acquire it would have been Roger Williams, who mm -hmm. we mentioned before. There were additions and extensions put on. Mm -hmm. The Georgian frontage, you would notice there. A building as fancy as that, that's almost been in continuous occupation through into the 17th, 18th century. It's a very classic period for doing massive landscape works. At that period, they were actually, they wanted ruins in their garden. And in some cases, actually building ruins. And in other cases, they were taking buildings down to look like ruins. Really? They had them already up there. I, I find it impossible to believe that they wouldn't actually use the castle in some way as a, as a detached garden. Although David's family demolished the mansion in the 1950s, Stuart thinks his 18th century ancestors might have incorporated the castle into an ornate garden. But as Matt's discovering, they might also have remodelled the castle a hundred years before that. So th could that date from around the time of the Civil War then? I would have thought it's, um, it's within that century anyway. So could all this activity explain why the gateway seems so impractical? This is what I don't understand. You see those walls there? Well, if Phil's right and that walkway is about halfway up that wall, yeah. then in front of it, we know there's a big pit, yeah. then it plunges yeah. right away down, then it comes right up the other side. It's not a very convenient way of getting in and out of a castle, is it? Well, actually, it does make a bit of sense if you can read the earthworks, actually. <laughs> well, something must have gone, that's all I can well, say. Well, um, you've hit the nail on the head there, because what we've actually got here is actually a quarry going all along that slope through right. there. But the interesting thing about it, it's a quarry for a Civil War battery which is what this big bank is here behind us. During the Civil War, they've dug out this slope, dug it all out, raised the rampart along there. And you can see, see on this 3D model, this is, in fact, mostly quarrying down here, the quarried into the slope, and dug the material out to create this earthwork along here. It's got two bastions, one on that end, one on that end, rampart in between there. But it's not only the Civil War which has got rid of some of this and created this lovely Civil War battery here. In the, in the 18th century, we've got a major landscaping right. phase going with a big house over there. Yeah. And they're bringing a carriageway all the way up this slope. Nice easy gradient for horse and carriage. They've ramped all this off and levelled and done all sorts of things here to get, be able to get into the castle up on top of the hill. So that's when the big hole was punched in? I would ah. suggest so, yeah, yeah. I'm still not convinced that I can see this being as the main entrance to this castle. Oh, music to my ears. Neither can he. No, I mean, I, that's what I felt. And all your explanations of the changes here just reinforce that. The other entrance is somewhere else. The main entrance is somewhere else. Now I get it. Before the land was remodelled in the 17th and 18th centuries, the gateway would have led out onto raised land, and with the drawbridge and portcullis, would have provided a heavily defended access into the castle. But while the archaeologists agree it would have been a grand entrance, they don't think it would have been the main day-to-day -day point of access, since you'd have to have skirted around the whole castle past the loos to get to it. So not content with sorting out one gateway, Ollie and Stuart are heading to the other end of the castle in search of another. Can you see this? This is good quality, like a, a batter. So you're so saying that's a, those are facing stones of the, of the outer wall? I think they are, that's right. They're nicely, nicely put together in there. We've got another standing wall just here. And then you've got this arch, a bit of fabric surviving. It's actually an arch. But you can see behind it here, we've got another big wall coming out of this one. You've got a gap, haven't you? Yeah. A void between the if two. You, bear with me. You can trace it coming out of that wall. It comes all the way around yep. here. It's coming out in a, a circular route, as it were. Then it's chopped. 
And if you go over there, there's another one. Seems as if it's like two, two towers, possible yep, yep. gateway. We're now getting to grips with the ruins, but I'm a little concerned by our lack of progress in the interior. Oh, yeah, I mean, crappy, Nothing's right? coming up on the geophys, which is strange, because we know from the documents that there were buildings here. So we're opening a trench between the gatehouse and the Lord's Tower, because we think that's the most likely site for the hall. Well, I have to say, on first inspection, it looks rather empty. Worryingly, like the one we closed this morning. It's this trench here that's really perplexing us because there doesn't seem to be anything in it at all. But what we do know is that right behind it over here is this really large and impressive building. Could this give us some kind of clue as to what's going on back there? As you can see, it's uh, got this evidence of a door here which would have swung out in that direction and then here there's a groove which maybe was for a portcullis another door here which went out in that direction over here there's a great big tower it is a lovely bit of architecture isn't it it is i mean it is a very beautiful and elegant room and what i'm cleaning up is a window seat uh, and I can imagine the ladies come in here in the morning, the sun's shining full through this window, come up here, up the steps, sit on what was a window seat here, and look out across the interior of the castle. But what would they be looking at? There's nothing there. Well, you found no structures, but whether we have a garden elegantly laid out... I see, so the reason that there would appear to be nothing here is that all that was there was garden, and we wouldn't see any evidence of that in the archaeology. I think if this land's been cultivated extensively over hundreds of years since, all those subtle features may have gone completely. So, what are we dealing with? A fighting fortress or the mother of all gardens? When we got here two days ago, it seemed like it was all going to be a doddle. We'd got these fantastic walls, presumably in the middle here, we'd get some really interesting castly things. But after two days digging, the sum total of our finds in here is that one roof tile, which seems really odd because it must have cost a fortune to build all these walls. And we know the de Clare family who lived here were really rich and really powerful. So why did they build all this? And why did they create this enormous space in the middle of it? And the scary thing is, we've only got one day left to find out. Beginning of day three here at Tredreg Castle in South Wales, where we're still puzzled by the fact that we've got these enormous castle walls and yet virtually nothing inside the castle itself. But if there's one thing that we're sure about, it's the quality of the workmanship of this tower that we've been calling the Lord's Tower. Look at that magnificent vaulting and the solidity of the stonework and this ancient white-haired professor. Because <laughs> Mick, you're really excited about the idea of actually getting in amongst this tower, aren't you? Yeah, because if you look across the site, we know we've lost a lot of the buildings. But if you look from here, see, it's, it's rising up. Can you see that? Oh, yeah, it really <clears throat> it really kicks up. It sort of banks right up yeah. to this wall, doesn't and it? And I think the chances of some stratification with fine surviving is more likely against these towers and the wall than is further over the, over the site. Do you think there's a chance that we might pick up some small finds that might give us some clue as to the lives that were being led by the people who lived here? Yeah, right by the tower we might expect to find window glass, for example, or architectural features, or even things like bits of wine glasses or bits of high-quality pottery that was in use by the people in these buildings. I'm a bit disappointed you're not peeling the ivy off the walls, but... I, I think that's holding the walls together. I think you're probably right. <laughs> Should we move slightly away from yeah. the arch? <laughs> So we've finally moved Phil from the gateway to open a trench just outside the Lord's Tower in a last-ditch attempt to find something in the interior. Because we've already closed two interior trenches with no joy, and Matt's come to the end of his trench at the other end of the castle. Well, there are two main features in this trench. The bottom one right in front of us here is a, it's like a terrace or a step. You can see at the bottom they've uh, reinforced it with a line of mortar, but most of that has weathered and fallen off now. There was some 17th century pottery underneath that, so we know that was still there in right. the 17th century before it collapsed. Back up here, 
The second feature, we thought it was another terrace, but on excavation you can see it looks like a robbed out wall foundation going across there. Yeah. Uh, they've taken it, all the stone away, and you can see they've backfilled it with all the old mortar. There was no medieval pottery or anything, but I think it might have all been cut away. I mean, there's been a huge amount of remodelling here, a massive right. step cut in there. Nice. Could well have been flattened across here. And, you know, they've chopped away each sides here and put the wall through, so it might have all just been completely uh, chopped away. Yeah. yep. So all this Civil War and 18th century remodelling might explain why we've got medieval buildings mentioned in the documents, but nothing in the ground. However, we still think that the area right next to the Lord's Tower might be less disturbed. And putting a trench in seems to have paid off since Phil's beginning to find a floor level. And at the opposite end of the castle, Stuart thinks he's found the main entrance into Tregree. What we've got here, Mick, is we've got substantial wall there. Yeah. See this wall coming out here, starting to curve round. Beyond that tree there, there's a very similar thing. So what we've got is the wall, two towers starting to come out and curve back round. To me, that's highly suggestive of a yeah. gatehouse. It's a much more likely position at the bottom end of the castle where it's easier to get mm. down the slope. Yeah. And presumably an entrance passage somewhere up the middle over yeah, here. Yeah, up on this area here. I mean, the walls are standing to, to nearly three foot high. So what do you reckon we should do? Well, what I'm thinking of, if we start up here, Mick, yeah. we'll be, be inside the tower on, on this side of the gate, come down through here. If we're right, there should be a passageway coming through yeah. here and then bring the trench over in this side and we'll have a look in, in this tower as well yeah. so we get, we get right the way across. I think we should get on with that. Let's get it laid out and start. Sounds like Stuart's actually going to get his hands dirty. I just hope it's not too late in the day to start opening more trenches. Although we have finally got to the bottom of our medieval loo. This is an amazing excavation. I never dreamt there'd be so much of it. No, neither did we. I mean, we started off looking for this poo pit and to find lots of beautiful finds, but we didn't find anything and it was really deep. What's that there? Well, that's a masonry mark. That's someone probably who made it and put a mark on to say, this is how much I should be paid or something. And what about this slope? One of the main things it's probably for is to get rid of all that horrible, smelly stuff out from under the toilets. It really would have been a fairly pleasant toilet as these things go. Only on Time Team could anyone be disappointed with the toilet being too clean. But if it wasn't for the lack of fines, I'm sure we'd appreciate it as much as they did in the medieval period. It's now mid-morning day three, and not before time, things seem to be coming together. In our latest trench, Stuart thinks he's located the main gatehouse. It's looking like a fairly substantial piece of masonry wall at the moment, isn't it? Yeah, it looks like the, the core of the wall, isn't yeah. it, all the mortared. And Phil's work on the Lord's Tower is also paying off. What you got, Phil? Oh, the most wonderful doorway, Tony. This is the main doorway, the main doorway into the Lord's Tower. Look, what happens? It comes along here, and then it tapers back here, and then we've got this beautiful... Look at this gorgeous decoration here. Beautiful. You've got to remember that, the, that all this that is represented here at the ground level was carried up in a magnificent arch that's going to meet up there and then follow down on the other side as well. The door is in here and it goes that way. Ah, because earlier we thought that the door opened that way. Yeah, but that was be before we saw this detail. You can actually see where the door would have been. It's in there. Look, and that is where the hinge would have been. So you're going to have a big pivot there. And then as you come through, the door swings back and you're in. That's a bit nice, isn't it? Absolutely stunning. That was just unbelievable. That is beautiful. Scarlett, how are we doing on fines? Um, apart from all this bedrock, we've had a lovely piece of colonnet. Um, What's colonnet mean? Well, basically, it's um, part of a window or a door, like frame, framework. As you can see, it's quite beautiful. But that doesn't look very much like the stuff that Phil's been finding. Well, no, the interesting thing is, if you look to what Phil was just doing, it's very angular, very square. Yeah. This is lovely and round. It's beautiful. It's sort of like this one. Ah. Oh, another one here! <laughs> hey! Ah. <laughs> so do you think that they're part of the same build as Phil's? Um, well, no, because they're more circular, they look like they're from an earlier phase, basically. How much further are you going to dig back? About another metre. Well, we're going for lunch now. I think it's imperative that you stay and get <laughs> us those small finds. Great, thanks. <laughs> Come on, Phil. Oh, I'm included in that. That's good. <laughs> But Scarlett's not the only one working through lunch. Helen's on a final hunt for finds, so she can tie up the history of the castle. 
we still don't have an awful lot of metal finds. No, but what we have got are pretty impressive. What do you think of that? That is absolutely gorgeous, mm. isn't it? I, you know, I think that's just about the best preserved medieval arrowhead I have ever seen. And, and it must have presumably been shot from a longbow because of its, its flatness. Oh. Yeah, isn't that lovely, David? That is exciting. Yeah. And very appropriate for our site. See, look at this, then. <clears throat> what do you think of that? Oh, gosh, that is a very <laughs> tiny little rowel from a spur. It's one of the earliest ones, and they're invented in the 13th century, so 13th, 14th century, I might put on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the Civil War period. No, I don't think so, no. But these ones look like they, they must be, and we've got three little musket balls. Um, and, and this, which is just the star of the piece, <laughs> isn't it? Really amazing. What do you think of that, Steve? Uh, well, it, it, we think it's a, a grenade. Really? Um, so, well, Civil War a bit later? Well, yeah, I didn't know anything about I, grenades. I've never I, seen one. No, yeah. I've never seen one. I would never have recognised it. No. But luckily, somebody did. They're about a, a cricket ball size uh, with this hole in the top made of iron, and you pour the gunpowder in, set a fuse, and then you fling <laughs> this... Uh, apparently, that was the problem. Yeah. You couldn't throw them yeah. far enough, and if they didn't actually score a direct <laughs> hit, they, they hardly worked. So they were virtually Return unheard of. <laughs> very, very dangerous thing. So that, I think, is going to be a really significant mm. find. Good. I have to say I'm really intrigued by these finds. On the one hand, they fit perfectly with my picture of a castle with knights in shining armour, fierce battles and bloody sieges. But on the other, they seem completely at odds with the overall picture we're building up of the castle. Fancy loos, fancy towers, extravagant feasts and possible gardens. My image of a castle is you've got a portcullis in the middle of the front, and then you've got walls that go like that all the way around, yeah, that's it. Yeah. And then you've got a stone floor in the middle for all the soldiers to march around, yeah. and up at the top people are firing arrows and chucking yeah. boiling oil. But this is nothing like that. No, no, that's because you have a very stereotypical view of a castle there. No, I can't believe that. <laughs> Surely not. Your image is, is absolutely right for so of a 13th century castle like Caerphilly, or Conway or Carnarvon, or one of those really big Edwardian castles, and they're built in just the way you describe. But of course, it's not very long afterwards. I mean, you only have to get to the 1400s before you've got gunpowder and cannon, and these places are redundant anyway. But the idea of towers and battlements representing power and status and so on stays on. The other aspect, you see, is that even early on in, say, the 12th century, the aristocracy, the top levels of society, are interested in gardens, somewhere to retreat to, somewhere where you could go and have a party with a small number, you know, romantic entanglements and all the rest of it. The right word for this sort of place, I think, when you get into that, is a pleasance. In a way, we should stop thinking of it as a castle and think of it as a pleasance. It's not a castle. Well, <laughs> I never thought I'd say that at the end of three days. <laughs> If you'd like to learn more about pleasances or medieval romantic retreats, log on to the Time Team website. It's now nearly the end of day three, and the team have finished working outside the Lord's Tower. Well, it's a shame we didn't get more small finds, but the architecture we revealed was really phenomenal. Just look at the quality of the architecture in front of us there. You've got a door. You've got a portcullis, the slot is just above us. You've got another door as well. And what would have been inside? Well, you're looking at serious medieval high quality living. You've got lots of rooms, chambers, fireplaces, windows. You've got that fantastic, exquisite octagonal chamber over there. The Lord even had a little hand basin to wash his hands in. And at the other end of the castle, Stuart thinks he's finally conquered the main gatehouse. What you see in here, the kind of where stones have been taken out from, they've been ripped out and been robbed off. But this is the edge of a tower which came yeah. round here. And what we've got over here are two road surfaces. So this is where the roadway entrance ought to be. Absolutely. You come up through here, there's one tower coming round there, yeah. another coming round here, and you'd have come up through here. Now, what is interesting about this is absolutely no evidence that the main curtain wall came through. So we know this is going to be, you know, there's a gap here. Yeah. And that, that tower is much smaller than that tower. So it's probably not built at the same time? No, it's quite a complex yeah. arrangement. So it's sort of resolved then? I think we've got a twin tower gateway, different sized towers, yeah. carriageways through it. It's been demolished. Lots of it's been yeah. robbed away at two or three different periods, probably. 
So having finally completed our attack on the castle, we're at last able to put together a picture of what Tregreeg was like 700 years ago. Look at this, Tony. It's a picture called The Garden of Pleasure. It was made in about 1485, and I love it because it's got this fantastic frame around with a curved top that makes it look like a scene through a window, just like the window we're sitting in here. There's an awful lot of stuff in the garden, isn't there? Yes, it's very busy, and we're lucky because the artist has put in an awful lot of things which you also find on these accounts from two of the, garden, the other gardens of Elizabeth de Clare. Now, you can see in the picture that we've got this lovely fountain here and a pool, and here we've got mention of a pool in the garden and a fountain made. And then we've got railings here and sandy paths, and we've got mention of railings and sand. And then, lastly, this amazing bright green turf. She's obviously rather keen on her lawns because she's, she's having turf taken from a nearby estate to repair her garden. There's something really quite erotic about this picture, isn't there? Well, it's called the Garden of Pleasure, and these, these two people are holding hands, but what else can you see? Well, what's that? Is that a leg? I think so. Golly. I wonder what he's doing to her. She looks very surprised. He's kind of going, ooh. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> I've really enjoyed peeling off the Georgian and then the Civil War layers to reveal Tregreeg's medieval splendour. And it's completely changed my view of castles, since life at Tregreeg must have been very pleasant. With massive walls and heavily defended gateways, the de Clare lords and, of course, ladies, were able to retreat from the dangerous Welsh marches and relax in their luxurious tower overlooking beautiful gardens. Well, we started out thinking we'd got a castle full of soldiers and we ended up with a pleasure dome. How do you feel about that? No, I'm just extremely excited by your visit here and everything I've seen has brought the whole castle alive, as you, far as I was concerned. You don't feel cheated that it wasn't what you thought it was going to be? No, no, we've found um, examples from the Civil Wars and medieval times, which is, you know, how I'd always wanted to date this place. Well, given that it was a place of fun, we've got one more treat in store for you. Phil, off you go. <laughs> hey, Phil! You hold that, stand in front of the target, and we'll start. <laughs> I know I'm as safe as houses! <laughs> To ensure you catch all the latest updates, please do subscribe to this channel, follow us on social media, and sign up to our newsletter, and join us on Patreon. <laughs>